Uh, let's have a look at this headline in the Daily Telegraph. NHS must reinstate woman in cancer and pregnancy web pages. Staff demand. Now, more than a thousand NHS staff have written to their bosses demanding that they must uh, do exactly as the headline has said. The Clinical Advisory Network on Sex and Gender, uh, a group of NHS staff, have organised uh, the letter protesting that many NHS web pages have begun shifting to gender neutral language. Um, let's talk to Dr. Louise Irvin. She she is a GP and also a spokesperson uh, for that group. Uh, she stood for election for the National Health Action Party back in 2017. Louise, why does this worry you? It worries me because I think there, there is potential harm to women, and this is being women are 50% of the population, harm to women if we don't have clear, unambiguous health information to help women understand their healthcare needs, the importance of screening, etc. And the harm can come because not just because of lack of information, but also by eliminating the word women, you are in some way conveying the idea that there's something shameful or wrong about talking about women and, and their, our bodies. And a lot of women get very, very upset about that. They, they feel it's disrespectful. All right. And they lose trust in NHS communication. Um, uh, Louise, I'm just going to give some examples, show some examples to our guests and um, our viewers. Um, you can see here, um, this is an NHS uh, mental health trust. Our team are developing a perinatal voices partnership networking group for birthing people who have had experience of using perinatal mental health services within Norfolk and Waveney. We can show you uh, another one here, um, NHS advice. In most cases, a miscarriage is a one-off event and most people go Go on to have a successful pregnancy in the future. Um, Louise, what is the impact of those sorts of pieces of advice to women? What have patients said to you? Well, when we did our, um, our letter, over 5,000 of the signatories were non-clinicians, were ordinary people, the vast majority were women, and many of them made comments. And there was one particularly poignant one, which is a woman saying, I was recently pregnant and never once did I hear the word mother. Other women who have been, uh, for example, who have had uh, ovarian cancer and have had their ovaries removed have said, you know, it's wrong to say that ovarian cancer affects those with ovaries. It still affects those without ovaries because they still have to be followed up for, for consequences of cancer. So it's, it's misleading. It's also for women who have suffered pregnancy loss. For some women, especially if they've had a stillbirth, the word mother, the idea that they were a mother briefly to that child they lost mm. is really important to them, something for them to hold on to. And oh. if that word is eliminated, mm. they find it really insulting and hurtful and compounds what, what happened to them, the trauma. I'm going to go to the, the other guests. Uh, Louise, please stay with us. Um, Dahlia, I'll come to you first of all. I just want to show this piece of advice uh, since we're talking about uh, ovaries and ovarian cancer. It says here, ovarian cancer affects the two small organs, ovaries, that store the eggs needed to make babies. Anyone with ovaries can get ovarian cancer, but it mostly affects those over 50. Are you sympathetic to what you've just heard? No, uh, this is about public health messaging and the most important thing about public health messaging is that anyone who needs to access a certain kind of care feels able to access it. And regardless of your personal views on gender, uh, politics, it is a fact that there are people who live and identify as men who are born with the capability to carry a child. And it is important for both the health of the baby and the health of the parent um, that they uh, are able to feel included and can access the healthcare they need. I think we can all agree, and there is evidence in the clinical literature, that uh, a lack of awareness about this particular group of people, you know, trans men, intersex people, um, can uh, put the baby and the parent at risk. And I'm sure we can all agree that we don't want that to happen. And this is, it's very normal to update language to reflect different realities. For example, you know, in education and healthcare institutions, we have adapted our language around parenthood to reflect the fact that it's not always mummy and daddy, that there are um, families with gay parents, there are single parent families, there are families where children aren't raised by the, their biological parents. Mm -hmm. So it's really common sense, uh, as Louise, far as I'm concerned. Louise, what do you say to Dahlia? I think there should be very good targeted information to help all trans people with their uh, about their health. It, it's a basic principle that if you are communicating with people, you have to be clear who your target audience is. Make sure you do the 
provide the right information, actually check with them afterwards. Is this the right the information that you want? And I would never deny that. But on the other hand, women, the vast majority of women um, are not trans people. They want, they also deserve uh, information that they can understand and that, that makes sense to them. There has been, with these changes, there was no research at all. And we found that out from our Freedom of Information Act on the actual impact on women on, on obscuring language, replacing, um, using phrases like anyone with a cervix. We know that something like 40% of women don't know what a cervix is, don't know they've got a cervix. My own mother said to me the other day, Louise, what's a cervix? And she's an educated woman. And over 20% of women over the age of 50 don't know that cervical screening can, um, can detect, um, uh, prevent cancer. Um, and we are seeing that level of take up of cervical screening is going down amongst women. One of the main reasons amongst young women not going for cervical screening is shame and embarrassment. Now, if we've got a word that is taboo, the word woman is taboo, doesn't that just reinforce age old shame around our bodies as women? Well done, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll get Dali to respond on that issue. It, it does feel like you're shaming, not you, but it is shaming women and it's become a taboo word to say woman, mother. Absolutely not. I think that the issues that are raised here are much deeper issues of education around our bodies um, that is not going to be, a, that is not really addressed by this particular issue. You know, we're talking about referring to people as people. So unless you don't identify as a person, I don't see how this is exclusionary or, or erasing you. But what about people who refer to themselves as women? Absolutely. I refer to myself as a woman. I think it's incredibly odd to say that by using um, a word like person that you're ashamed to use the word woman. We're just trying to use accurate language. And the accurate language is that there are people who can become pregnant or who can have cervical cancer who don't identify as women. We're just trying to be accurate here. Oh, They're Louise wants doing... to come out and I'll come to you. Sorry, yes, Louise, please. go on. They're not doing the same for words about men. And this is really crucial. Well, they should. The, word, the words... No, they shouldn't. I, I don't they agree. Should. I think we need clear them. information. For example, if you have an explanation of what is cancer, of, what is cervical cancer, and the answer is cervical cancer is cancer anywhere on the cervix, which is part of the reproductive system. It doesn't actually men, may, say it's a male, part of the male or female reproductive system. Um, that is very different from the previous formulation, which is cervical cancer is a cancer that women have on their cervix. The cervix is the, at the, entr the entrance to the womb at the top of the vagina. It explains really clearly what the cervix is, where it is, and that it is a woman, a part of a woman's body. Now, this obscure language is actually not helping to educate women or men or people about their bodies, their sexed bodies. And even the NHS's guide to inclusive language says that where sex is relevant, the word sex, sex so related how... should be used. And also the women's um, health um, strategy for England right. is very well, clear that is, we should be is, using women's how words. How do you address the fact that there are people who do not identify as women for whom these issues can impact and therefore, and they are typically erased or, or not not included in these kind of care services how do you propose that we um engage those people then well i think i think their needs are very important and health services should engage them and should be available for them and we should be actually targeting information specifically for their needs for example a trans woman may well have a need to both um have uh screening for prostate disorders or may well have testicular problems but may well also because she's taking hormones estrogen may well also need um breast screening so may well actually need elements of screening that apply typically to men and women right. but that's that's these are tailored approach to individual variation which well, is, a you know, is a very important i think it, we it's need not just targeting powerful I think messaging. targeting but when we're but universal about, messages when, have to reach the 51 percent of the population who when, when, are women right. and who currently are and not so relating do women, to this literature that's why so, so many women not letter. feel included in the word people or person no, i don't they, understand they, and, and how come when you look at all other forms of medical literature or medical um public health guidance where the word where word the word people is used when we're actually i want to i want to raise a really important question because when we're talking about gender specific health care Actually, I think 
this is much less of an issue. What's more of an issue is the fact that the way that certain symptoms of what are considered to be generalised conditions appear in women, for example, heart failure or heart mm. conditions, are not legible as that. All right. That's actually the real issue. All here. right. Well, let's, that, well, let me let me you know, uh, hang on. Over, with, let me bring it, let me bring in the others. Um, Alex, first of all. Well, it sickens me that on International Women's Day, instead of focusing on areas of women's health care that really need boosting, whether it's menopause medication, whether it's menstrual support, whether it's fertility treatment. We're actually talking about whether the word woman can appear on the, the, the publicly funded NHS website of medical guidelines. I mean, this is utterly abhorrent to me. I get your point that actually we do need to make sure that people are included within healthcare provision. And here you have a healthcare expert telling you, uh, and who has acres of experience, that this situation where we're having the word person and sort of conflagrating various concepts textually will end up excluding a huge amount of the population who rely on this information. We do have, rely we on do have websites. evidence in the clinical literature research um, recently emerged out of Durham um, that uh, healthcare messaging that insists on a gender binary in this way does underserve people or, um, from ge with gender variant. Well, um, Dahlia, uh, and, and that's population and that's compared to the 51%. All right, Dahlia, Dahlia I'm, going to, I'm going to just bring in the guys over here. Um, Lloyd. I mean, I don't think there should be a ban on gendered language in NHS guidelines, whether you're genderising or sexing the language, there's a slight difference there, woman or female, but, but where it's accurate, it should be used, and it should be allowed to be used, and where it needs to include more people, you can use alternative formulations. I don't think there should be a one-size-fits-all. Instead, we need to do case by case. For example... There may be many reasons why you don't want to say mother, because there might be two mothers in that relationship and you want to be clear on talking about the birthing parent. It might well be that it's a surrogate who doesn't consider themselves a mother because it genetically is not the mother. So you want to use we, a term. Mm. So I, I just think that... Are we, it over be, are we overcomplicating it, it? It needs to be the royal colleges and all the, the professionals to get together, well, work out what is the best... That we've got one professional here, but there's a yes, whole but she swathe represents, of other... She says yeah, a very large represents number. represents 1,200 out of mm. uh, the biggest staff in the world of any organisation, bar the Indian Railways. Um, you know, OK, so she represents a, a, a small group within right. that staff network. The experts need to get together right. and work it out. Well, and, we've and got one expert who's given... For everyone, and then I think that this should not be a political discussion. What should be the political discussion is how we fund and support women with mental problems. Is it, how we is make it, sure that women... Well, then there are political supported. discussions how, about how, that, but let me get the key bit. Women with menopause. No, right? I'm saying you can't. Right, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's exactly what I've said. It's about accuracy. I think those words should be able to be used. Right, if it was shouldn't be. All right, but let me put a different question. Are women being discriminated by this advice? Let me try and be the bridge of consensus across everyone. Oh, Saki, please. There's a bit of a very generous of you. Look, the thing is, this debate gets very heated, and my starting point in all this is obviously people who are transitioning should be given the most compassion that that should absolutely be the case but we're hearing from the healthcare professional over there that you know on international women's day i'm certainly not going to say we shouldn't have women uh, on on the websites the women's health strategy clearly sets out you should have sex specific stuff i would hope that the health professionals can use their common sense and professionalism to uh, to navigate the the minority and not discriminate against the 51 percent. so keep thank you and thank you to you uh, dr louise irvin for joining us today um, and happy international women's day